so I'm very excited to introduce this panel. It's a, an incredible panel exploring a important and sadly a very highly relevant topic, the weaponization of love, exploring the dark side of manipulative love and finding genuine loving kindness. And so joining us today, we have Venerable Bhikshuni Kama Lekshe Somo, and she's joining us online from Hawaii. Venerable Bhikshuni Dr. Kama Lekshe is a Buddhist monastic and a professor teaching at San Diego University. She began meditating in the Zen tradition in Japan in 1965 and then studied with USN Goenka and His, Holy, His Holiness Dalai Lama and other teachers across India from 1972. She, rece she received novice ordination in France in 1977 and full ordination in Korea in 1982. She also received a PhD in comparative philosophy at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, where she is the 2023 Numata Professor of Buddhist Studies. Um, we understand, uh, Venerable, that you are not feeling so well today, and I just want to express how deeply grateful we are for you joining us. Um, Please be kind to yourself, and um, it's very generous of you to be here. I also want to welcome back to the stage, um, here in person, Bhante Sajato. Bhante Sajato is a senior teacher in the Thai forest tradition, and he also runs SuttaCentral.net, which is a very popular uh, website for early Buddhist texts, translations, and parallels. It contains, suttacentral.net contains the world's only freely licensed translations of the early suttas and all five collections um, of the Nikayas, which were translated into English by Bhante Sajato himself. Bhante Sajato, as we've mentioned previously, has been instrumental in reviving and supporting the Bhikkhuni Sangha, and he is also a a passionate supporter of environmental justice and First Nations people's rights. Um, I am a, a student, as many of us are, of Bhante Sijato, and um, I feel I could say that Bhante Sijato is a Dharma genius. So we're very grateful for him being here today. And our third... <laughs> it's true. And our third panellist today is Ajahn Bramali, who is joining us from Western Australia. Having completed degrees in engineering and finance, he began his monastic training as an Anagarika in England at Amaravati and Chithurst Buddhist monasteries. Listening to the teachings of the wonderful and remarkable Ajahn Brahm, he decided to travel to Bodhanyana Monastery, which is located in Perth. And he has been there since 1994. He later received higher ordination, also under Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn Brahmali has published a number of essays, including the book of authenticity of the early Buddhist texts in collaboration with Bhante Sajato. And can I just say, as um, I'm also a student of Ajahn Brahmali, that you are also a Dharma genius. <laughs> so, um, and Bhikshuni um, Kama, Dr. Kama Lekshe, I have no doubt you are also a Dharma genius. So what a heavyweight panel. <laughs> and uh, our incredible panel today is facilitated by none other than the phenomenal Tina Ng, who is the founder and the president of the Meta Center. So over to you, uh, Tina and our esteemed panelists and scholars. Thank you so much, Letty. What an amazing introduction. Thank you, Letty. Yes. And welcome, venerables. It's so wonderful to share this space with you. And Kama Lekshi, so good to see you again. Last time we met was when you came to Australia for the Sakyadita conference. So good, great to see you again. And wonderful to see Ajahn Brahmali again. We only saw each other on Monday when, of course, you joined the Buddhist Bowl Trivia with Bhante Sujato. So welcome back to the Meta Convention. Thank you. Uh, no hard feelings, Venerable. <laughs> 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 That's right. 
Uh, today, we are really blessed to have the three Venables with us. And in particular, we've got an interesting topic that we'll be exploring from different angles. And in, we want to first start, if it's okay, with Venerable Kama Lekshi. If you could start first, because I understand that you may need to duck out. And Kama Lekshi, my understanding is you have a different interpretation of the topic and you want to talk about something different, which is dealing with politics and difficulties in the workplace using meta. And I thank you for bringing that topic to light because that was also one of the questions that we had from the audience and we didn't quite get to that question. So it's great that, that you already had that in mind to want to talk about. So handing over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, I would like to first acknowledge that I stand on the lands of the Hawaiian people who have preserved the culture and religion and language of Hawaii for centuries. And we will, are hoping to do our best to work alongside and also try to restore the earth and create world peace. <laughs> so. Um, yes, it's a bit awkward to go first since I don't know what my uh, esteemed colleagues' views are, but um, I thought I would start by uh, really questioning the topic. Now let's see if I can, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this thing is um, jumping all over the place. Okay, so um, I wanted to question the concept of the the weaponization of love. Now, I suppose there's probably a whole backstory on this that I've missed. Um, th so I really uh, don't claim any expertise on this. Um, and I have just gotten out of the hospital and I, I'll be leaving to go back to the hospital in um, about a half hour. But um, so I'm a little bit, um, shall we say underprepared? maybe. But now, um, what uh, the blurb that I got, which I think were ideas from um, Venerable Sajanta about the idea of love and faux concern being weaponized to drive toxic narratives of bigotry. Well, okay, so I'm not sure exactly how this works, um, but let me take um, a little Stab at, oh, that's violent language, isn't it? Sorry. Okay, so um, we'll um, start by saying, what does it mean to weaponize love? Is there such a thing? I must say that I don't really resonate with the concept. If we take the Buddhist definition of loving kindness as wishing all beings to be happy, then how exactly can this be weaponized? Hmm. So, of course, I, I always feel it's my duty to stir the soup. So I'll be stirring in several different directions here. And just tell me to, to um, be quiet if I misspeak. <laughs> but now here's um, what I was thinking, is that in truth, the Buddhist concept of loving kindness cannot be weaponized. If it's pure loving kindness, it's pure. Uh, and it cannot be turned to serve another purpose. Oh, we take definitions, well, you know, in the Tibetan tradition, we take definitions ever so seriously. And we'll debate them for right, years. And no, no joke and um, trying to come to some understanding of what the concept means. So, um, in this case, we would um, look carefully at the idea of loving kindness as being the wish for all beings to be happy. And then, of course, it's correlate, which is compassion, uh, wishing all beings to be free from suffering. Well, so, um, I thought to give us an example, you know, it says that um, there is, he says, Venerable uh, Sujata says, 
there is a genuine love and a spirit that inspires true religion, religious devotion and spiritual living. How do we find that in ourselves? So now this is this resonates with me more than the, the concept of the weaponization of love. But you know, it's always best to try to uh, make an example, to give examples, um, to see if we can get a little closer to the understanding of, of the topic. So what I would like to do is share a PowerPoint. And this is because I didn't have a voice. I still don't have, I mean, my voice is still very weak. Um, but I think um, I would like to take an example from Burma and let's see if I can get this to, uh, let's see, to share screen. Is that going to be possible? Oh yeah, it looks like it. Okay, great. Now, thinking that I might not be able to talk, then I thought pictures are worth a thousand words and let's see what happens. Okay, so um, let's see here. You're sharing the screen. Oh, that wasn't supposed to do that. Hmm. Anyway, um, I wanted to, please bear with me. I'm really not firing on all burners here. <laughs> um, so I can just at the top where it says slideshow. Yes, there we go. Thank you. Um, sort of, um, techno-illiterate yeah, slideshow right. from the beginning. Yeah? Is it good? That's perfect. Okay, wait a second. Now we've got chat going on, eh? So let's, let's try that. Okay, has enabled closed captioning. Okay, Is, do I need to be concerned about that? <laughs> Maybe not. Okay, so here's what I'm going to take up in the few minutes that we have, um, which I don't even know how few they are, but anyway. Um, loving kindness and compassion in conflict zones. So when I heard the word weaponization, I thought, oh, okay, that must mean conflict. Um, so two tarnished Buddhist principles. And I'm going to take the example of Burma, um, now officially called Myanmar. Um, to illustrate my point. Okay. And forgive me if this doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Now let's see if I can get it to move down. Okay. Here's um, a map of Myanmar and the capital that they've newly established uh, some, some years ago. And I, I guess I should preface it by saying that I, I taught for Antioch University in the um, you know, Burmese Vihar in um, Bodhgaya for a couple of years. And so, you know, we saw the generals trooping through, um, yes, seriously, um, pointing their feet at the Buddha and lighting up gigantic cigars right in front of the Buddha. So this was all very interesting. Um, what I'd like to point out here is the geopolitics going on in this region, which is, you know, we're looking at China, a giant, no one wants to tangle it, and, you know, the Indian Ocean. And China needs to get its products out, and this is the cheapest way, so they need to, yeah, they need to take over this, these lands, which are very rich lands. Um, especially a kind state all the way down here. Okay, so then we're skipping ahead whether we want to or not. Um, meaning that, um, you know, Burma has a very ancient tradition of Buddhism, um, which has been threatened by, you know, I mean, British colonialism and many other factors. Uh, but, um, it has survived by the hardest, and um, but in what form? Okay, so that's what we're going to look at. Um, there's a large uh, assembly of Buddhist monks, and um, 
nuns are not considered part of the Sangha in Burma uh, for some reason. I'm not sure why, because they behave very nicely and they follow the precepts. And I think um, they deserve to be considered part of the Sangha. Now, are you seeing my slides okay? Hello? Everybody seeing? Okay, yes, great. Can see, yep. <laughs> okay, good. So here's our little monklets, and um, we also see some nuns. Now this um, painting is from um, Malaysia, Penang, at the Burmese Vihar there, and it's um, right on the gate of the Burmese Vihar in Penang. And you can see that the nuns are dressed in the pink outfit, which uh, probably did not come into being until you know, 50 years ago. So we've got a little time regression going here, but that's okay. And we see the main point being that the Buddha has taught monks and nuns, as far as we know, from the very beginning. So that means, of course, I always have to get a little feminist plug in here, but you know, that would mean that um, the uh, Buddha actually was very much concerned about women and their spiritual development um, and their liberation. And we could say that um, he was a real pioneer in that regard. So um, the nuns have a pretty good position, actually. They have access to education, and uh, they are allowed to study Pali all the way up to the Dhammacharya degree, as, as I understand it. And a number of nuns have been um, exceptional in their understanding of, especially Abhidharma, but many other subjects as well. So um, the Women uh, and men in Myanmar are allowed to um, take uh, go to the monastery one month each year, um, whether they are, um, you know, they're allowed to like take leave from their jobs and go for one month retreat right in the middle of, you know, in front of God and every oh my God, Buddha and everybody. Okay, so. Um, so children as young as six and seven are actually joining the monasteries, including young girls. So this is something we don't see in every Buddhist country. It's something to be noted. Okay, now one of the most famous Buddhist women in the world, shall we say the, the most famous, perhaps, uh, in contemporary Buddhist world, I should, yeah. Um, should know that is on San Suu Kyi. And this is a storied, I um, mean, this is a story because she is the daughter of An San, who is considered, oh, I don't know, my notes aren't showing up, but that's okay. An San was, uh, is often considered the father of modern Burma, and he challenged the British um, for, you know, and was, um, quite successful, I mean, so successful that they assassinated him, um, unfortunately. And um, so um, she went on to become a political leader in, uh, in Burma and uh, has a huge following even today. But the story is a little bit complicated, as most of you have probably uh, recognized by following the news. Um, she um, was um, put under house arrest for almost 20 years, during which time she says that she was uh, practicing Buddhism. She was meditating and uh, practicing. So um, that's quite remarkable that a world leader, uh, I mean, it's the head of the Democratic Party in Burma would admit to having a spiritual life. I mean, I think that's quite uh, exceptional. 
and uh, she came into contact with many world leaders. Um, and so, um, then trouble broke out because of the, uh, the, mm, yeah, overlordship. I don't know if that's right. Um, let's say, well, anyway, they, um, the monks and nuns rose up to oppose the, um, military government in Burma, and uh, it was bloody. Nobody knows to this day how many uh, monks and lay people were slaughtered or are still in prison in Burma uh, today, but it was definitely brutal. So um, she was the poster girl. I, I don't mean to make light of it. She was really the a symbol of, of um, democracy in Burma and, um, and led the party, the Democratic Party, f for years and created a movement which um, is not easy to do in a country, a hegemonic country. So she was um, she took huge risks to oppose the military dictatorship. And so that's part of her legacy. Now, around the same time, and we could trace the connections here, a, a movement of Buddhist nationalism uh, evolved. And this is the face of Buddhist terror, which is Virata. He only uses one name, but he has a monastery outside of um, <laughs> Sorry, my brains are not really working, <laughs> but um, outside of Somebody help me out here, but um, anyway um, He has a monastery. I went to see him. He wouldn't see me. Um, I was not surprised. His monks wear a particular, uh, they have a particular way of folding their robes or wearing their robes to distinguish them from other, other monasteries. And um, he is um, an opponent of the Muslims in Myanmar, Burma. Um, he sees his position, he and his many followers, um, see his position as uh, in defense of the Dharma. I'm really skipping over a lot of history and please forgive all errors. Um, he, um, yeah, so they um, have um, been accused of racism and um, of violence in the name of Buddhism perpetrated against the Muslim population in Myanmar. Um, again, uh, skipping over decades of Buddhist history, um, the uh, government was, um, yeah, the government was opposed to the Muslims and pr propagating a uh, a line of, um, yeah, an argument that the Muslims were responsible for everything that was wrong in Burma. They were trying to take over the country. They have too many children, all on and on the same old, you know, same old arguments. And so, um, unfortunately, he has quite a, yeah, huge following. And, um, and most of them, a large percentage of them are monks. Now, I find this quite embarrassing because as a Buddhist, I always associate Buddhism with um, nonviolence and loving kindness. So, um, not only I find this very embarrassing, but many Buddhists throughout the world do. So, often now when we go to teach, especially in places like Southeast Asia, 
when it comes to Q&A, the first question is, what's going on in Myanmar? What's going on in Burma? Um, and it's very hard to, to oh, I make no attempt to defend it because I, I don't agree with it. So, um, these are well-known publications, obviously Time Magazine and so forth. He has a very personable, uh, you know, personality in a sense, but uh, there are many, many problems there. Many villages have been torched. Nobody knows how many thousands have been killed. Um, and did we mention that this is a very, very rich um, part of, of Burma? The lands there are very rich, uh, in, you know, agriculturally and so on. So, um, this is a problem. And so, over a million uh, of these Rakhine people, the Rohingya, have migrated from uh, Myanmar to Bangladesh, where they live in exile under deplorable conditions. And I, I want to challenge, you know, Buddhists everywhere. Well, what are we doing for these people? I challenge myself to, what are we doing for these people? Mm -hmm. So, um, Uh, we won't even go into the details. It's too horrible to to recount. Um, yes, I have to stop now. Thank you for bringing to us a very different perspective. To yeah. uh, could I have just one more minute? Yes, of course. Go. <laughs> Finish up. Okay, so some Muslim judge who was um, assassinated. There've been many assassinations, but we know that the four Brahma Viharas are uh, part and parcel of the, you know, the uh, trademark of, of, of Buddhism, the Buddhist traditions, compassion, may all beings be free from suffering, loving kindness, may all beings be happy, sympathetic joy, rejoicing in the qualities and good fortune of others, and equanimity, calm and even tempered in all situations. So that's the end of my PowerPoint. And um, I welcome your critiques <laughs> so, and, and your corrections because, as I say, I'm not um, being completely straight here. So I will shut this down. Thank you, Kamalikshi. So, and yeah. as I was saying, thank you so much for firstly being here despite your illness. Um, thank you for being such a trooper and I really wish you wellness and good health. And thank you for bringing a very different perspective to this topic on the weaponization of love and importantly also raising awareness about what's happened in and happening in Myanmar as well and the plight with the Rohingya um, population over there. So thank you. Uh, Bhante Sujato, this particular topic was of course something that you had suggested. Uh, what Kamalekshi has brought forward is a different perspective on this topic. You're welcome to comment on that or if you would like to perhaps talk to what you originally had in mind when we talk about the weaponization of love exploring the dark side of manipulative love and finding genuine loving kindness great topic can talk thank, about thanks way. thanks tina um so venerable, venerable lecture so sorry to see yeah your health not good and i think all of us Hoping that everything goes well as far as that goes. Oh, by the way, some good news though is that we have translated the Meta Sutta into Hawaiian. So if you have any friends there that want to read it in Hawaiian, there we go. Right. Very good. Thank you. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, like we, uh, I'll, I'll talk more, more about the topic in a minute, but I mean, the, uh, actually, the kind of thing you're talking about was exactly the kind of thing that I was actually getting at where we can use Dhamma in a way that will hide out, you know, these these very harmful actions behind good intentions. The one thing in your talk that I, that I think that you, that I would like to hear you speak on, um, you mentioned Aung San Suu Kyi and then you mentioned the Rohingya, but you didn't mention about her role vis-a-vis -vis the Rohingya, which is something which has caused a major change in world perceptions of her and so on. So I wondered whether you had anything to say to that. 
Well, I, I definitely do, and I don't want to take you know more than my allotted time, but um, one thing I uh, definitely want to mention is that while she was under house arrest, she was she said that she was meditating, and in her tradition, in the Theravada tradition, I mean, metta is an integral part of um, of the path, and so I find it rather, I mean, extremely um, disappointing that she did not um, actually mm, take up. Uh, Buddhist methods of trying to to bring loving kindness into a negotiation process that could have perhaps I mean of course she would have risked her life to do it but everything she did she was reaching she was risking her life so um, it seems like uh, but still I think people around the world were quite surprised and disappointed that uh, she did not bring forth uh, loving kindness as um, as a methodology for resolving the crisis. I mean, we've got all these beautiful teachings on how to to uh, resolve violence and so forth. Why someone in her position, which I mean, is one of the most powerful women in the world, uh, did not, as far as we know, I don't speak Burmese, but um, did not use um, these uh, methods to resolve the racism and violence um, um, against the Rohingya people. So that's mm. that's one of my key concerns. Yeah, I mean, I, I must admit I'm kind of torn on the one hand. Yes, I, I this you know disappointed to see what she didn't do as you're saying, but on the other hand knowing that she's under all kinds of constraints and pressures that that we don't even you know we can vaguely guess at but we don't really know so yeah i think it's very difficult to very difficult to play so ajahn from mali say something can i yes of course we'll come back to you ajahn from mali can we come, come back to you in just a second <laughs> So I just wanted to just talk a little bit about this kind of idea, what I was thinking of with weaponization of meta. Actually, it's just trying to throw out a topic title that I thought might be interesting. I don't read too much into it. But um, story many years ago, and this was somebody who was prominent at some point in some Buddhist community somewhere, but I'm not going to specify anything. And you don't know them, so don't try to imagine who this is, okay? Someone who's prominent in the Buddhist community, telling me a story about how they were coming back through customs. And the customs agent was like, okay, you know, you're gonna have to open your bag and you know, do you have this and this and you open this and they were getting really kind of like, oh, why are you doing this? And do you know who I am and blah, blah, blah. And then what's in this bag and what's that? If you've ever come into Australia, you know that customs can be quite stringent. Yeah, for, for, for at least sometimes good reasons, but anyway. Uh, and so she, you know, she was telling me how this agent was so unreasonable and all of these kinds of things. Eventually they finished, packed everything up. He said, okay, you can go now, ma'am. And uh, she said to him, may you be happy. How brutal is like, how do, you, how do you recover from that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So this is kind of the, the kind of thing that I was uh, thinking of. Like, so sometimes as as Buddhists, we can have this idea, and yes, as Venerable Lecce mentioned, the idea of metta is something which is very pure, and of course we are aspiring to reach to that idea. And but sometimes we can be thinking that we are there, but actually we're not. So we can cover a multitude of sins, as it said in the Bible, uh, with our idea that we are a Dhamma practitioner, that we're a Buddhist. Uh, I mean, that's a very extreme example of what's going on in, in Myanmar, of course, and really kind of devastating, and one that has effects. Like we've had people, no, I shouldn't say people, one, one woman yell at us down the street in Harris Park, you know, how can you be wearing that robe when that man is saying those terrible things about the Rohingya and so on? But like, robes have been around a lot longer than that. Um, but, you know, it has, it has changed the perception of Buddhism. Um, but also, like for me, okay, the, the 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 language around that was derived from political science. So in political science, the last few years, they've had this idea they call the weaponization of interdependence. 
And the idea there is that, um, like globally in global relations, uh, interdependence is generally speaking uh, a force for good because it builds bridges between people and you know trade routes and all of these kinds of things will you know make connections between people and that is a force for world peace i think this is something which is really important to acknowledge is that peace is not something that just happens or that something that happens only at the, the the muzzle of a gun but some peace is something which is built by ordinary people doing ordinary things every day which includes diplomats and politicians but it also includes business people anybody who's ordering something from china anybody who's contracting like we do we contract to work in, in poland for it work and all of these things that we're doing all around the world or if you're just going on holiday or if you have family overseas anything that we're doing these are things that are building peace by building connections between people all over the world and so this is this kind of global interdependence so the political science idea was that this kind of interdependence can then be consciously manipulated and weaponized by bad faith actors who are then going to be saying well that's great you know you, you know you're buying all our stuff now and but what what if we didn't sell it to you yeah and so in a in a time when we see heightened tensions between china uh, and australia and china and the us then these kinds of uh, relations and dynamics are kind of being explored that way so i think that there's a there's a kind of a parallel i guess uh, with how we can do these things in Buddhism, and maybe on a larger sphere, but also on like a, a, on a smaller sphere. I'll just give you one more example. I don't, uh, won't talk for too long, but recently I was in uh, in Jakarta and talking to a bunch of people about different people come to me with their different issues, got no idea why, but they come to me and ask me to help solve the problem. Free, that's right. Yeah, cheaper than therapy. That should be. <laughs> That should be our slogan. Come to see the monastics, cheaper than therapy. And um, so this one young lady came and she was talking about her boyfriend. She had this kind of older boyfriend and, you know, he was like lazy and didn't want, kind of want to work and all of these kinds of things. And she, she was quite young. She's like 20 or something. And she's like, oh, you know, but, but I think he can get better, you know. And I'm sitting there. I'm sitting at the seat. See, I have, then have this dilemma as a monk. You see, as, as a human being... I'm like, dump his ass, dump his ass. <laughs> and I'm trying to say, how do I express this in a monthly manner? Um, <laughs> and Let go of this relationship. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can't, what can you say, right? So you try. But, but that same kind of thing, because she, she was a good person, you know, and she she wanted she wanted to enter that relationship with that spirit of metta and kindness, and she she would see like a, a small thing that he might do, like like he might be just lazy and not do anything, and then he might say, oh, I'll do better, babe, and she'd be like, oh, good, he's going to do better, and that's like all he has to do, that's like the minimum bar that you have to cross, and then she, uh, so again, this is the way that that metta can be manipulated or weaponized or something like that. Uh, there's an example in the uh, 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 book by uh, Lumpur, Lumpur Fiang, who talked about uh, a lady he knew who was a noodle seller, meditator, and a noodle, she had a noodle stall in Bangkok. And somebody would come, came up to her and said, oh, you're a, you're a Dhamma practitioner, right? Well, you should, you should give away your noodles for free. <laughs> Right? This practicing generosity, that should be your practice. So she went to ask her teacher about this, and he said, well, just tell him you didn't become a dumber practitioner so that you'd become an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to keep our wisdom and our discernment about it, and we need to, to, to understand that our love and our metta and compassion goes hand in hand with wisdom. And it's not that these things kind of compete Right? But it's that true meta actually needs wisdom and it only flourishes in the presence of wisdom. A number of uh, talks uh, in the weekend so far have addressed like what do you do when there is you know, somebody who's evil or somebody who's causing harm and how do you have compassion for them? Like, okay, but first of all, let's have compassion for the people who are being harmed. Like that's number one. 
And if we want to have compassion for someone who's doing harm, the number one thing that we can do is to stop them. First stop, I think Venerable Lecture has to Lecture. go. Venerable? Oh, you're on mute, sorry. I think you're on mute. You're on mute. We cannot hear you. That's okay. I think you may be saying, thank you so much, I need to go. That is very much okay. <laughs> thank you, thank yeah. you so much for- Yeah, they've come to take me away. <laughs> Oh, oh my goodness. Okay. Thank you, you so much. Great idea. I'm so sorry for missing this. May you be well and happy. <laughs> See you next time. Thank you. You can tell this is live. Right. We don't make this stuff up so chaotic. as we go along. <laughs> Madness. <laughs> Madness and yes. yet it all goes well. Yes. Yes. So anyway, so that was just wrapping up what I was just saying. If we have compassion for someone who's doing wrong by stopping them, right? If they if they're doing wrong with the wealth that they're using, we have to take the wealth away from them. If they're doing wrong with the power that they're doing, we have to take the power away from them. If they're doing wrong with the words that they're doing, we have to take their words away from them. It's called cancel culture. Love it. Okay. <laughs> and when we're on social media and these kinds of things, block, block, block. Number one, if you're, we have to stop giving these people a voice. Deplatforming works. It's extremely effective. And it's only when these people are actually facing consequences for their actions that they will start to reflect. Otherwise, they'll just keep on, keep on, keeping on, keeping on. Right? And at, at the, you know, the most extreme cases, if someone's causing harm, we have to take their freedom away from them. We have to lock them up. Again, not because we want to hurt them, but because we want to stop them from hurting others and in doing so, in hurting themselves. Yeah? So this practice of compassion, don't, don't let your, your Buddhism blind you to the fact that you know, we need to live in a world where people are notably imperfect. And sometimes that means doing things that we may not want to do, but that are necessary in order to protect those who are being harmed by this uh, manipulation. Anyway, just a few thoughts there. Thank you so much, Bhante. Someone online has said, as always, Bhante Sajato clicks. Ajahn Brahmali, thank you so much for waiting patiently for your turn. Uh, so well, I was reading the blurb and one of the questions that stands out is, can one love like a Buddha? So hearing what Kamalekshi has been saying, hearing what Bhante Sajato has been saying, enlighten us. Can we love like a Buddha? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for inviting me once again, and it's nice to be with you. And uh, when I see these titles by Bhante Sujata, it's always a bit daunting to see this kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of political kind of issues, because he's much more into those things than I am, uh, to be honest. Uh, and yet, uh, I think if we bring things back to the Buddha's teachings, uh, we can bridge that gap between the, uh, you know, the difficulties in the world, the abuse of these beautiful concepts, uh, and actually figuring out how to use them in the right way. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, kind of standout passages in the suttas of Metta, which I think everyone knows about, uh, is of course the simile of the saw. You know, the famous simile of even if bandits kind of cut you apart with a two-handled saw, uh, sounds Two handle, I think, is just to make it sound extra painful, but it sounds really bad. Huh? So, two handle the sword limb by limb, yeah, still, you're supposed to have metta and compassion towards those bandits. Huh? And that's kind of really hard to comprehend. How can you have compassion towards bandits who cut you apart limb by limb? It sounds almost impossible. Huh? And so, it is a very interesting teaching because some of the teachings that are the most fascinating. Uh, are the ones that actually are challenging. Because when something is really challenging for you, it means you have to reflect on it. You have to uh, consider, well, maybe the if it is the Buddha, maybe there is a point to this, even though I can't really relate to it, uh, what is actually going on here? Uh, so when we come across these very profound teachings, uh, there is a number of ways we can react to them. And a kind of the one of the ways to reacting to this sort of teaching is just to kind of put it to one side and say, I don't want to see it, it's too difficult, it's too challenging. Let me go on to something more simple, like watching the breath, uh, which might actually turn out to be even more, <laughs> even harder. But anyway, whatever it is, right? So it's uh, we put it to one side because it's too challenging. And that is okay to some extent. Initially, it is fine to do that. Uh, but then there is another uh, way of dealing with this, which I think is really problematic. Yeah? And this is where this idea of the weaponization of love kind of comes in. Uh, first of all, 
you deal with it by forcing yourself to kind of do a practice that you're not ready for. And when we, when that happens, it leads to two really, really bad consequences. The first one is what is often known as spiritual bypassing. You don't deal with your real problems. You don't deal with the issues that are actually there. You try to go straight to the deeper Dhamma without actually resolving those things that actually will take you to the deeper Dhamma. And this is really, really problematic on a personal level. But then there is this uh, problem when you have these very profound teachings, uh, is that teachers will use these teachings uh, to quieten their students. Uh, yeah, Be quiet, don't complain, have metta, have compassion, understand what is going on. Uh, and this is a very real problem in spiritual circles. Uh, and I know that because I too have had that happen to me during my years as a monastic. Yeah, This is almost universal to some extent. Uh, and I think very often the perpetrators of these things yeah, who tell you practice the simile of the saw, they don't really understand what they're doing either. They don't really comprehend that this is a kind of oppression for the person they're saying these things to. It is important to deal with things properly and then maybe we can move on to higher ideas like the simile of the saw. So what then is the right approach to the idea of metta? How do we get in touch with profound teachings like the simile of the Soha. And so this is the third way of approaching this. Yeah, Don't ignore it, don't bypass, but instead ask yourself, what are the foundations for these things? What do we have to put into place to actually maybe achieve a higher kind of mind where these things actually start to make sense? And one of the things about the, uh, the suttas, the word of the Buddha, if you read it carefully, you will find out that there are always the basic things that you do first and then as you do the basic things you start to purify the mind the mind becomes capable of doing the intermediate things and when you are super duper pure and you have this wonderful kind of things are really coming together and your life is really kind of starting to make sense and you have a profound sense of meaning then you come to the really deeper aspects of the dhamma understanding what comes first what comes in the middle and what comes in the end is just such an important thing in these teachings so what are the things that come first and this is something you found in places like the uh, the uh, Kosambiya Sutta, which is a sutta about uh, uh, the quarreling and arguing monks. Uh, and the Buddha lays down some uh, teaching, the six Saraniya Dhamma, six memorable qualities and ways that we should deal with each other. Uh, and what they start off with uh, is not the simile of the saw. In fact, the simile of the saw isn't even mentioned <laughs> in this particular sutta. What it starts off with is metta, by body. Yeah, so your bodily actions come from the idea of metta. Metta here being friendliness or loving kindness or however, however you want to translate this beautiful word. But you start with the basic things, how to treat people around you with kindness through your bodily actions. Yeah, give someone a cup of tea, give them a pat of the, on the back, you know, treat them with gentleness, your general demeanor of your body will say something about your mind state. Uh, what is your demeanor in the body? Is it a kind of a peaceful demeanor or is it more aggressive demeanor that you have about you? Uh, so this is where it starts out. Uh, and then the Buddha says that this sort of uh, uh, actions of metta through the body, it should be done both in private and in open. Yeah, so there's a sense of integrity about what you're doing. Uh, yeah, so always the same regardless of what you're doing. Uh, and then this last thing that he says there, which I find is really fascinating, uh, and that is that the idea of metta, he's speaking to the monks and perhaps the nuns, these are to the monastics, uh, and what he says is that you should have metta towards your fellow monastics. Uh, and then he just entered Nibbana right away. <laughs> Stillness. Stillness, Bhante. Stillness. I and mean, it can happen well, to forget any about the lay people. Huh? And he's so thinking about lay people there, right? It just sorry. because it says sorry, venerable, something. Venerable, sorry, there. Sorry, to, sorry, to, venerable, sorry to interrupt, but we, we, we just missed out like a bit. About two minutes worth. You, you froze. I froze. Okay. How, how much more time have I got, Tina, just to be, be clear? Enough. We have enough. We have until 1.20. Okay, oh, sorry, but I, when should I finish? 
220. Yes, keep going. Keep going. You, you, you're good. <laughs> you're on okay. point. All right. Uh, so and one of the uh, one of one of the things we find in there, as I was saying, which is really fascinating, is that the meta is primarily focused on your core monastics. Uh, yeah. It doesn't say anything about lay people. It doesn't say anything about all beings. It doesn't say anything about people overseas or whatever, but about the people around you. And I think this is a very important point. Instead of starting with some kind of fancy idea of metta for the whole world or metta far away or metta for the devas or, or whatever it is, we start with the people around us. And very often that is precise for the people that is most difficult to have metta towards, right? Because we brush up against them all the time. The people that work, our family members, our co-monastics perhaps in certain circumstances, yeah? These are the people around us. And if we can have metta towards those people, it is actually not so hard to spread it out to the rest of humanity yeah? because you have resolved the issues around you. Yeah? But if you start off with the kind of the rest of humanity, but you don't resolve the issues with the people immediately around you, again, it can very easily become a kind of spiritual bypassing, not dealing with the things immediately in front of you in your life. Then there is the, then the Buddha says, the second thing then is to have metta through speech, yeah? And he says the same thing about speech, having the metta towards in private and in open, I hope we don't, we don't speak too much to ourselves in private. That's usually a bad sign. But uh, anyways, good speech, yeah, wherever it might be. Uh, also, again, towards the people around us uh, being the most primary thing. Uh, and then, as a third factor, uh, the Buddha says, uh, we should have metta in mind. Yeah? We should think about our fellow monastics uh, yeah, again uh, with metta or our fellow lay people around us, wherever, whatever your station is in life, the people around you have met. Then comes the mind. In other words, learning to think about people in the right way, having the kind of view, the kind of right view. Right view is really at the foundation of metta and karuna, loving kindness and compassion. If you have the right view, if you understand people in the right way, metta comes almost as a matter of course. It is a natural function of the idea of right view because you understand the limits of other people, how conditioned they are, how they are suffering, how they are trapped in this life, etc., etc., etc. So you learn to think in the right way. And then, then when these three factors kind of come into place, yeah, in other words, the morality on a very deep level, then it becomes possible maybe to have the kind of metta that they talk about in the suttas. Metta for the whole world. And that is where the idea of the simile of the Soma starts to kind of fall into place. But before I do that, I want to tell one little story from the suttas that I always found very fascinating and very powerful. And it gives us a very nice idea of what metta really is about. And this is the story of the three kind of ideal monks in the suttas. The three ideal monks, they were always living together. This was Anuruddha, Kimbila, and Nandia. And they were always living together. And there's a few suttas about them. They must have been very kind of uh, highly regarded at the time because of all the suttas about them. Uh, and uh, on a couple of occasions, uh, I think they are, these occasions are mentioned on the, uh, maybe three times or something in the suttas, uh, the Buddha goes to visit these monks. Uh, the Buddha arrives, there's a long story behind this. One of the best places to read about this is in the course, in the uh, Upakilesa Sutta, in the middle length saying number 128. It's a very, very beautiful story. And it's one of my favorite suttas at the moment. Tomorrow might be a different one, but right now this is one of my favorite suttas. Uh, and uh, in this sutta, uh, yeah, the, first of all, the Buddha is very, uh, is a bit kind of, uh, uh, had fed up with the monks around him because they're all arguing and quarreling here. And then when he gets fed up with the monks around him, he says these beautiful verses. And these are verses that you find in the Upaklesa Sutta, you find it in the Vinaya Pitaka, you find it in the Dhammapada because they are so famous. And these are the suttas about, you know, the, the ones about the, the one who thinks like uh, they beat me, they robbed me, they defeated me. Uh, you know, the one who thinks like that will never give up hatred. Uh, but the one who doesn't think like that will give up hatred. Uh, hatred is never overcome by hatred in this world. It is always overcome by love. This is an eternal law. Uh, it's these kind of verses. They are very, very famous verses in the uh, Buddhist tradition. Uh, 
And then the Buddha leaves these monks behind because they are arguing, they're causing trouble, they're basically causing a schism in the Sangha. And then he goes off and visits the three ideal monks. And of course, the situation is the absolute opposite, right? So the first thing the Buddha asks them when it comes to them, he says, are you living in harmony here? They reply, yes, uh, yes, venerable sir, we're living in harmony here. And then the Buddha asks, well, how is it that you're living in harmony here? And this is where it gets interesting, right? How are we, how do you live in harmony here? If we can understand how these arahants, how these ideal monks in the Sutta lived in harmony, we have some idea what maybe we also should be doing here. And one of the beautiful things that is in there, some of them are standard, yeah? It says things like they are blending like milk and water, yeah? Which means that there's no friction between them. It's a kind of, they don't um, separate like oil and water or whatever. They blend like milk and water, which is already kind of a nice idea. But then uh, Anuruddha says to the Buddha, he says that, uh, um, he says that uh, when, uh, uh, when I think of my fellow monastics, uh, Kimbala and Nandiya, I think how fortunate I am, how extraordinarily fortunate I am to have companions like this in the spiritual life. And this, to me, is such a beautiful teaching. It's such a beautiful way of thinking about the people around us. How fortunate we are to have all these wonderful people in our lives. How fortunate we are to have people like Bhante Sujata or Karma Leksha, these kind of great monastics doing this really wonderful work around the world. How fortunate we are to have all of these beautiful lay Buddhists yeah, who practice Buddhism in the very difficult realities of ordinary life. How fortunate we are to have so many good people, not even even outside of Buddhism, there's lots of goodness happening in the world. But at least focus on the people around you, those who really support you. How fortunate we are to have these people around us. And this to me is almost a, it's a beautiful idea, a beautiful expression of the idea of love and metta. Seeing that great fortune we have, remembering the blessings in our life, seeing actually the qualities that are available to us through other people's company in this way. It's a marvelous thing. And if we can do that, if we can emulate these great monks in this way, it is, I think it is... Um, uh, there's almost no limit to what we can do. And we end up with the idea of the simile of the soul. Huh? So how then, uh, if we are able to put this foundation into place, uh, how then can we practice this idea of the simile of the soul? Huh? How does this even make sense? Uh? And the reason why the simile makes sense uh, is because you have to understand it through some of the most profound teachings of the Buddha. And that is the teaching of non-self. Uh, once you understand the idea of non-self in the right way, uh, the outcome is that you have compassion for all the perpetrators in the world. Uh, yes, we have compassion for the victims. Uh, of course, we have a compassion for the victims uh, because we see the suffering. Uh, but once you understand the idea of non-self, uh, how we are driven by all of these tendencies in our mind, by all the habits from the past, how we have been programmed in past lives, uh, how our personality is formed in a certain way, uh, if I ask you, can you step outside of your personality, what is your reply? Of course you cannot, because your personality is exactly what you are right now. You cannot step outside of that. And if that personality is formed in a certain way, you will do certain actions, certain actions that sometimes are terrible without really understanding the consequences. The person who is sawing you limb from limb with a two-handled saw, presumably they think they're doing something useful there. This is good in some distorted, crazy way. They think they're doing something good. How can you not have compassion for a person who thinks that an evil act is good? You have to have compassion for them because you know, yes, they are destroying the life of the person who is being sawn apart, but they are destroying their own lives far more than they're destroying the life of that person. And if you can have metta while these other people are sowing your part. You will go straight to a beautiful rebirth anyway. Yeah? While they, yeah, you can maybe thank them for sowing your part. It means you get to the beautiful rebirth more quickly. Yeah? Wow, thank you for taking this soul out, <laughs> chopping me up. Yeah, but the person who does the act, uh, they have a long, long, long period in front of them uh, of all kinds of problems uh, as a consequence of the terrible actions. Uh, 
So in view of the broader Buddhist teachings, in view of having a goal that is beautiful and worthy of moving towards, uh, having something to aspire towards, uh, this idea of the symbol of the soul can be very powerful and incredibly useful, uh, but it needs to be understood from this broader perspective. Uh, start with the basic things, uh, build up stage by stage, don't spiritually bypass, don't use these teachings in an abusive way, uh, and then gradually, each one of us has that ability to follow even the most profound teachings, even including the simile of the soul itself. Okay, Tina, that is my little contribution, so uh, please. Such a yeah. profound contribution. Thank you so much, Ajahn Ramali, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Uh, Bhante Sajato, you're welcome to comment and respond, uh, but in particular, in the blurb, these questions have been posed. I'd love to hear your answers to them. How does true love manifest in a world where hate wins clicks? How can we weaponize love on the side of love? So when hate wins what? Clicks. So clickbait. Oh, hate, win hate wins clicks. You know, people so. like watching stuff where yeah. you know, it's hateful. True. Damned algorithm, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, me? Yeah, hate wins clicks. <laughs> but I, I, yeah, I would say that uh, I, I'm always a bit surprised when I hear that um, uh, people who are supposedly, uh, you know, bad or people who are um, uh, sociopaths or whatever, it's often said that these are people who are successful in the world. But I don't think that's always true. Huh? In my experience, a lot of the people who are really kind hearted and good people often have a lot of success. Huh? And I have seen that, um, you know, I know I know a few people who have been incredibly successful and some of them are extremely good people. And they are successful precisely because they are good, precisely because other people trust them, precisely because other people don't feel threatened by them or whatever. And that's why they succeed. So I think there is many different ways of success, but I think kindness actually is one of them. Uh, if you treat your employees well, if you treat your fellow employees uh, in a good way, generally speaking, you will be, uh, people will be pleased with you and they will lift you up uh, and you will actually have success in that company because no one feels threatened by you. Uh, so I think that sometimes kindness is really underestimated in this world. Uh, and I think it can be a very powerful way of actually uh, bringing a team together and having a kind of solid sense of harmony within, among people that can make, the, make for a really good company, a yeah? powerful company doing something good in the world. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think that's, that's true, but I, I don't think it was quite, the, the question was specifically about clicks, right? So the question is about what people are going to like and be influenced by on the web, especially on social media and so on. And this is something that has been shown multiple times by studies is that hate definitely does motivate clicks, right? You're more likely to click on things. And these days, like, uh, honestly, like most social media, like even YouTube and things like that, I mean, well, every, every thumbnail is so horrible. I just, I, it's just like someone with this ridiculous reaction face and all of these kinds of things. And I'm like, oh God, no, please not. And, and I just like close it down as quickly as I can. Uh, it's it's a really difficult thing to say. I think I think that that rather than prioritizing necessarily hate per se, I think all of these things are prioritizing reactivity, and and hate is one of the emotions that's the easiest to kind of trigger, and then that gets you a reaction, and then the reaction gets you ad dollars, and that's what drives the internet, and all of the you know social and political and personal cost to that is just externalities so it's, you know, they don't, don't really care because it doesn't affect the bottom line i think it's a huge problem uh and i think that you know in terms of our interaction then we need to do what we can to not do that to not engage with it and to try to support others to not do that but I would also say that we should also, we need to legislate the social media companies. There needs to be laws to stop these kinds of things because they will not stop it themselves. Thank you. So there's some action that we can take with this as well. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. as individuals and collectively. Yeah. yeah. Thank and I think, you. you know, I think in terms of our own presence, mm. definitely to make sure that we, you know, manifest a positive presence on social media, 
And, you know, if you're going to post something, wait, <laughs> look at it again, revise it, uh, and go through. Actually, there's a beautiful um, video with, uh, what's his name? Um, it's fairly general. Uh, uh, the I haven't given you a lot of clues as to the person whose name I'm thinking of. TV presenter, used to present for kids, beloved character, Mr... No, not Mr. Squiggle. So, you know, the, the guy who, who, who would always like be very kind of kind and very gentle, the way that he would talk about... Yeah, maybe... What's his name? Someone... Anyway, it'll come to me in a minute. Anyway, and there was a, there was a really good explain on how he did his messaging that he would always go over it. Again. Is it Rolf Harris? You mean? Sorry, oh. Rolf Harris. <laughs> Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, thank you. Yeah, thank you Mr. for Rogers, someone online. Yes. No, Rolf Harris was definitely weaponizing meta in entirely the wrong way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, Perth, Perth boy there. Anyway. Um, uh, so, but he would go, it wasn't just an accident that he was able to do that, but he was very careful in the way that he would speak and he would go over and revise it again and again and again, checking his, his vocabulary and his, his, how he was phrasing things and how he was approaching ideas. And I think that, that that was a really good example of how we can try to uplift our presence in uh, social media and in the digital realm. Yes, thank you, Bhante. Someone online has asked, so how can we legislate when social media is controlled by people outside your boundaries? Yeah. Uh, so uh, there, there is this concept, which it's a slightly abstruse concept. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's called nations. Okay. <laughs> so we have one here. We call it Australia. And we have a government. We elect our government and our government makes laws. And any company that wants to operate in Australia has to keep those laws. So if we want to make laws that's going to govern how Facebook or Google or anybody else runs in Australia, we just make the law and they have to keep it, otherwise they can't do business here in Australia. The thing I think that's important to bear in mind is that, that our beloved friends, colleagues, relatives, Dhamma practitioners in the wonderful United States of America are not going to do this. Okay, so the Americans are not going to legislate their tech companies because their government is teetering on the brink of collapse in multiple ways anyway. Europe has made a start and they've made some steps forward to actually meaningfully legislate and, and to try to address some of these issues. And there is no reason why Australia shouldn't also be one of those countries. And if multiple countries around the world start to step forward and start to say, no, 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 we should not be hosting this hate speech. No, we should not be promoting bigotry. No, we should not be ex promoting extremist content. Then this will start to have an effect on the management of those companies in the United States or wherever else they're based as well. Thank you, Bante. And also don't underestimate our power as individual consumers to the products that we choose to use and how we wish right. to use them as well. Yes, thank you. Um, someone has asked online, Venerable, with the simile of the bad wolf, does the bad wolf deserve meta and compassion as well? I think Bante, uh, as Ajahn uh, Brahmali, you've touched on that but anything else you wish to add to that question does the bad wolf also deserve meta and compassion as well the bad wolf yeah uh, yeah 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 absolutely i think everyone everyone deserves meta and compassion i i was recently um, invited to a a, a kind of a multi um, religious event and we we're talking about the idea of this was a Christian event and they wanted to hear the opinions of various religions on Christian ideas basically and they were talking about the idea of evil because the idea of evil is very problematic from a Christian point of view how can there be evil in the world how can there be so much suffering in the world when the world was created by God it's kind of very hard to get your heads around that and so they wanted to hear the solution of other religions to these things and of course, one of the Buddhist ideas is that there isn't really anything evil as such. There's no inherent evil thing. There's no solid evil in the world, which is always bad and always terrible. Evil is a relative thing. One morning you wake up and you feel a bit evil. Another morning you wake up and you don't feel so evil, right? It depends on the, on the circumstances. And so there is no inherent bad wolves in the world. They are just your bad wolf one day and then one day you are different. And then we need to understand why these things come about. Why 
do some people have more bad qualities than others? And the answer is always conditioning. And that conditioning is always impersonal. It is not something we choose. I believe personally that everyone knows deep down that kindness leads to happiness. Yeah, if you are kind, you will feel good about yourself. You have a sense of self-worth, a sense of self-esteem. You know that your life is going to be good. So those people who are not able to act on that, even though they know that kindness leads to happiness, the reason is because the conditioning is so strong. They're acting against their own best interest as well as against the interest of everyone else. So it's like almost like a bit tragic in a sense, yeah? You're destroying your own life while destroying the lives of others. It's, it's really tragic, yeah? And so the right way is to have really have compassion for everyone, for the victims, but also, strangely enough, for the perpetrators, uh, because they are trapped somehow in wrong view, in wrong understanding, not really figuring out what is going on in this world. Yeah? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, we have another comment slash question, again, about media and social media. So perhaps to you, Bhante Sujato. So, so much media has always been driven by capitalizing on fear, while cruelty and extremism can be minimized on social media by law. Is it a truth that fear will always drive media consumption? Some people choose to switch off all media. Yeah, uh, it's a good question, and definitely uh, that's the case. I mean, one of the sort of classic examples of that is that uh, pretty much at any time and any place, people think that crime is getting worse. Uh, but the reality is that for you know most of certainly most of the lifetimes of the people here, crime most of the time is getting better, and that doesn't really get the news. It was a good example in a local paper when I was just uh, teaching uh, in near Sydney, and there's a local paper, and the the headline, big headline of the local news was break-ins up by five percent, right? and then you read in the body of the article it says like all kinds of crime were down. Every kind of crime was down except for break-ins, which were up by 5%. So that was a very kind of clear example of that. So yes, that fear, it's the same kind of thing. It inspires reactivity, gets attention, gets eyeballs, and then that allows people to sell advertising. Are there alternatives to that? Uh, look, you know, we can't change the fundamentals of human nature, but we can start to provide alternatives. Uh, one, I mean, just to give a couple of examples of things in Australia. We have, uh, as well as uh, media that's driven by advertising and the need for advertising do do uh, dollars, we also have the auntie. We have the ABC, which is not driven by the same thing. And, you know, when, as Norman Gunston many years ago joked, he now had his show on the ABC and he could broadcast out to like dozens of people all over the country. And so maybe not so many people are going to watch it. And maybe it's not perfect, right? But it's something else. And so I think it's really important to bear in mind that we that that having multiple different models is the thing. Doesn't not that that one model has to be perfect, but if everything is going to be driven by clicks and by advertising and by eyeballs, then that's going to drive things down a certain way. And so we have to make sure that there are other models as well. We check that model, curb it, moderate it, and then make sure other models are available as well. Um, see, here's the thing. We have got into this place where we, where, where, where we have this defensive posture towards the technologies that we use and which we think might be possible. And we think of them in terms of how are we going to reduce the, the harm that these technologies are creating? Why are, we do, why are we like that? We have more potential than we ever have, ever. We can create incredible things. Why isn't our question, how do we maximize the benefit and the abundance and the, 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 the love and the, the, the flourishing that these technologies are going to promote? Why is it that we've chosen to go down this way where that we admit that these technologies are creating tremendous harm and we are desperately struggling to find a way? How do we curb the harm for this thing that we 100% created ourselves? We made those things. We can make something else. And perhaps some of these meta-conventions is an alternative as right. well. 
Um, and someone has said online, why doesn't good news sell? We'll get warm fuzzies all the time. Not a bad way to live. And why not create a social media platform for positive change? So some food for thought for I mean, I mean, I think there have been a number of attempts like that. Mm. But, yeah, do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, stop complaining. Whoever that was, stop complaining. Make <laughs> your own social media network. Go on. <laughs> There you go. You've got Bhante Sujato's blessings for you to do that. There you go. <laughs> Ajahn Brahmali, um, next question's for you. In the workplace, it's often said you need to be cruel to be kind when making people redundant. Is it ever kind by being cruel? <laughs> I, think, I think we need to distinguish it between action and intention. I think these things are very, very different things. And uh, we can always be kind in intention. We can always do the right thing. Yeah? But sometimes our action may outwardly seem cruel because sometimes we may need to correct somebody. Sometimes sometimes it may be necessary to make someone redundant. Yeah, There may be some people who destroy the workplace or, or sometimes the company may be on the verge of bankruptcy or whatever, and you have no choice in the matter. Yeah? And so then it may be that the action looks cruel, yeah? but it depends on the heart of the person where they're coming from. Yeah? I remember my own father, my own father was an executive in a, in a kind of large shipping company. And he said that one of the most difficult things in his life uh, was this feeling of having to make people redundant. The company he was working for was very close to bankruptcy. Uh, and there was only one way of dealing with it. They had to make some massive structural changes in the company. Uh, and he said it was the most heart-wrenching and difficult emotional thing in his life uh, was to tell people they had to go, right? He didn't want to do that. Uh, and so cruelty on the surface may not be kind of cruelty further down. And I think if we are careful with how we deal with people, if we deal with them in the right way, if we communicate properly, uh, we can actually make even the most difficult decisions more humane. Uh, we can make people understand the necessity of what is going on. Uh, and then we can kind of be... Uh, be kind even when there is a feeling of uh, hardship or difficulties or whatever. Yeah. I think I think that 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 phrasing though is kind of like that's kind of smuggling in that kind of ill intent behind it, right? I mean, cruelty in and of itself is taking pleasure in the pain of others. You know, so if you if you're having to make a hard decision, other people might be hurt. Yes, but that's one thing. But if you're enjoying the fact that they're suffering, then that's where the uh, cruelty comes in. It's like the opposite of mudita. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, we probably have time for one last question, Bante Sajato. With legislation comes censorship. Where do you draw the line between censorship and free speech, especially when it is used for political purposes? Okay, so, uh, well, there's a few things to pass out here. So number one is that when the Buddha spoke about speech, he didn't really talk about free speech. Right? He talked about right speech. And so what he did was that he called upon us to take the responsibility to use our speech well, to use our speech truthfully, to use it kind for, kindly, uh, to use it to bring people together and to use speech meaningfully. And that is a huge challenge so as Dharma practitioners, this is, again, why rather than chasing around the coattails, okay, of social issues like free speech and so on, why aren't we setting the example? Why aren't we stepping forward and calling people to use right speech? Right? Now, at the same time, uh, in the time of the Buddha, there was actually a very high degree of freedom of speech. And even with the um, religious teachers at the time, some of them taught things that were pretty outrageous. Uh, and, you know, they taught that you can go around killing everybody and then there's nothing wrong with that. That's a kind of problematic thing, right? I mean, that would get you cancelled very quickly today. So... There was a, people did actually enjoy, in some respects, a very high degree of freedom of speech, and you, you know you can see that in Indian culture, where you know there is a kind of an abundance of different ideas and philosophies and all of these kinds of things. It's always kind of been like that. So in a way, we can kind of take freedom of speech for granted, and yes, of course, it is a genuine problem uh, in certain countries. 
uh, where freedom of speech is suppressed and is controlled by the government, and China being a good example of that, uh, where speech has been controlled and is being controlled in the media uh, to an astonishing degree. And we can see echoes of that over, overseas. Um, uh, what was it now, about a year ago or so, towards the end of COVID, right, when they were just, remember at the time when they were just about to come out of the lockdowns and they started having these protests and so on in Beijing. Now at that time, if you search, during those few days, you want to search on Twitter for Beijing, you get endless, every, every post is, hi, my name's something something, I'm a 20 year old student in Beijing, would you like to meet up? And then the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one, and the next one, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, just by coincidence, of nice young ladies in Beijing who wanted to meet up, just because you search for Beijing on Twitter. Right? So this is one of the ways that the Chinese government floods the information sphere. This is all, of, co of course, Chinese government propaganda, right? They just pump this stuff out to distract people, turn people away. Even if they can't censor it, they can still they have their ways of stopping conversation. So this is a genuine issue, and I don't mean to uh, dismiss it as a genuine issue in certain places. But in, if you're living in a liberal democracy like Australia or the United States and these kinds of places, then having freedom of speech isn't actually an issue. What's an issue is that people want to be able to say horrible, harmful, hurtful things and never have any consequences for it. And they should have consequences for them. And if they're not going to act in a mature way, unfortunately, sometimes companies or even governments need to step in because that hateful, harmful, hurtful speech can lead to violence and it leads to uh, genuine harm to people. So we can't dismiss the reality of that problem. But at the same time, like I said, from a Buddhist point of view, our focus should be to say, how can we uplift speech? How can we hold people to a higher standard of speech rather than saying our standard of speech should be, can I get away with saying something awful, right? Our, our standard of speech should be, how can we say something wise? How can we say something meaningful? How can we say something that will make the world a better place? Beautiful messages. Thank you, Bhante Sujato. Ajahn Bramali, do you have any closing remarks before we end this session? <laughs> no, I, I just, first of all, just kind of just uh, brief on the idea of, of freedom of speech. I think the idea of freedom of speech is like, very important when it comes to the uh, how democracy functions. F democracy doesn't function without freedom of speech. It's really a political thing. And in the political sphere, it is really fundamentally important. But so much of our lives are nothing to do with the political sphere. And so there, isn't, there shouldn't be any kind of need in many of these cases to, to have a kind of absolute speech to, you know, to abuse each other and all these kind of things. Uh, within the political sphere, you need more, I think, more of that freedom. Otherwise, it kind of breaks down. Uh, but uh, otherwise, it is, uh, you know, not so useful, uh, obviously, and certainly as Buddhists, it's very different. Uh, but uh, I would just like to say thank you very much, Tina, and thank you for Demanda Sajato and Karma Lecture, who has disappeared, uh, and to everyone else who's organizing this. It's a wonderful initiative, uh, and it's wonderful that you are uh, you're driving these uh, beautiful conventions and all the wonderful work that you are doing over there, and I think that we together we can we can create a better world. And I always think that people feel far more powerless than they actually are. We are much more powerful in our life uh, than people often think. Yeah. And sometimes you may say one kind word to somebody and it sticks in their mind, right? It is like a ripple, ripple effect. You kind of throw a stone in the pond, it ripples out. You say one kind word and it ripples out to the people around you, moving from one person to the next one. And we should never underestimate the power of kindness. And sometimes we look for response in the other person. We look for a response of gratitude or response that is kind back or whatever. We should never look for that. Uh, we should just be kind, trusting the power of kindness, knowing that it will do something in the world. Uh, and when we have that trust in kindness and we do, we just do it because we know it's good, uh, then it's going to be, uh, then we are heading on the right track. And then uh, the rippling out into society of large will happen, even if just a small way. I think it is very, very useful. So my best of luck and my best wishes to all of you have. Sadu, sadu, sadu. And we look forward to seeing you in Sydney. Yes. It's true, yeah. <laughs> I remember. We'll see you over there, yeah.
Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Venerables. I really appreciate all the support that you've given to Meta Centre and sharing with us at this Meta Convention. And of course, thank you to Carmel Lekshi. And I hope that um, she's also doing okay over there as well. So thank you. And I'm now going to pass the mic back to the MCs. Thanks, Jane.